right, so for this video, I just want to talk about mid-air collision risk and avoidance for VFR flying. And I've also got some pretty cool uh, close calls with bird strikes, uh, some footage coming up after. So to set the scene here, uh, this is a day where we, uh, I'm flying with a buddy who's also a pilot. We'd closely been watching the weather for this one, and we came close to scrubbing the flight because it's right about at our personal limits for both of us. Uh, the ceiling was 3,000 broken and we're going to an airport that's about 50 miles away that neither of us had been to in a while and frankly at this point neither one of us had done a lot of cross-country flying in the past six months so we were kind of looking at it as a, a little warm-up done a lot of cross-country flying since but previous to that it had been a lot of local flying so personal limits are important and that's a whole other discussion but anyway this one I was very conscious of the fact that I was close to my personal limits I like to be higher and I don't like this feeling of the ceiling kind of crushing down on you the idea of scud running is scary to me and I never want to really find myself in that kind of situation anyway getting off topic bottom line so we got a 3,000 foot ceiling we're going a long way uh, we can't be up at the altitude we want to be at in this case we're heading westbound so we'd want to be at 45 or 6,500 feet uh, you know if you're using the cruising altitude orders or if you're heading eastbound you want to be at 35 or 5,500 feet but of course that's moot because we're a 3,000 foot ceiling and we're VFR so we're sitting there at 2,500 doing the best we can to stay as high as we can and be legal uh, which brings up a good point why not fly at 2,000 on a day like that because everybody else is probably going to be trying to do the same thing flying at 2,500 trying to be legal uh, case in point it's about to happen and what's what's worse is that because I'm dealing with personal limits and you know trying to back myself up with my navigation I'm also messing around with VOR tuning right now and uh, making sure my GPS is all sorted which are things I should have done on the ground but I kind of figured it's an easy leg I can mess around with that stuff in the air it's also worth noting at this point that we had done our due diligence as far as radio calls we're about 10 miles out at this point and we had made the calls on the uh, traffic frequency letting uh, other aircraft know that we had left. We're currently monitoring the practice area frequency and I have the, the frequency tuned for center to get flight following which I'm in the process at this point of uh, I'm literally just about to make the call. I had tuned to it and was listening for any conversations that I didn't want to interrupt. Having said that though, I bet I would have been able to get on top of it sooner and might have had flight following established sooner if I wasn't distracted also messing with VORs and GPSs which are things that I should have and could have done on the ground before departure which would have minimized the need for eyes down time because again I'm, I'm glad I'm flying with my buddy because he actually spots the plane that we're about to see before I do uh, I don't know how long it would have been before I spotted it but he called it out and I immediately rocked my wings because I saw how close it was going to be and as you can see he's above us just slightly and I mean that's close on a GoPro that's a wide lens that's quite a close pass and not much altitude above us in uncontrolled airspace that's close I was running it again so you get an idea of how fast it happens. So there he is just appearing off in the distance and I mean if I didn't see that plane or if we didn't if we both had heads down, that's you know, three, four seconds and we would have had a conflict and he came out of nowhere. Uh, luckily he was above because it is easier to spot a plane that's above against a white cloud like that. Uh, from his perspective, I would have been pretty tough to see. Uh, here's here's a couple images that I got one time in controlled airspace, I had a passenger with a camera with me and uh, the controller asked us to spot traffic that was going to be passing below and beside us so uh, we, we found the traffic and I don't know that I would have spotted this plane without the controller's help. Um, now it is against a forested background but if that was an urban background in my experience planes just blend right in. I mean see those buildings just above there if, if he was lined up with those buildings or if there were more buildings than trees a, a plane below can just blend right in. So I'm just going to run it one more time there, the, the close pass footage, and uh, summarize so, so the key points that I take away from this experience. And you know, one is do as much as you can on the ground to minimize your eyes downtime. You know, and and then if you do have someone with you, especially if it's not a pilot, why not give them the homework of of looking for traffic? Honestly, part of my briefing has always been to uh, make it a challenge to have my passengers help look for traffic. Obviously monitoring radio frequencies and redundantly monitoring other frequencies such as CTAFs as well as practice area or local frequencies is critical. But something that you can't overlook is, is to take advantage of is flight following. You can't always get it but most of the time you can. 
uh, in my experience, it's, I'm not super experienced, but I often have more than positive experiences with controllers happily giving me flight following and, and traffic advisories along my route. You know, we were we were trying and we were going to do it, but unfortunately, you know, this is just one of those classic cases where the conflict happened at a time when I was most vulnerable. I was heads down. I didn't have flight following. I was low and I was at the same altitude where this guy ended up being. It was not a coincidence because we were both doing the same thing, essentially scud running, trying to stay legal and be as high as we could. And you can be dealing with virtual ceilings as opposed to cloud ceilings, such as uh, the upside down wedding cake airspace uh, ceilings that you find around large international airports. I've actually got one in Toronto where uh, the international airport has the big wedding cake. Even though I'm flying from a controlled airport that's quite close within 10 miles of the international airport, I'm still often stuck dealing with a 1700 foot ceiling. Um, so I'm trying more often than not to fly that route at 1500. I mean, the extra 200 feet is not going to help you a whole lot in the event of an engine failure. But knowing that the odds are that I'm 200 feet away from opposite direction traffic gives me just that extra peace of mind. So this, this video went way longer than I planned, so hopefully this didn't drive you guys crazy listening to me droning on. Um, definitely would appreciate any feedback or thoughts on that, and, and please give me your thoughts on, on how you guys avoid traffic. Uh, I know I, I promised some uh, near-miss bird strike footage at the beginning of this video, but uh, I've just run way too long here, so what I'm going to do is make that a separate video about bird strike risk and uh, I'll put that one up uh, today as well so there won't be a wait for that video but typically what I'm going to do is try to do a video per week so uh, please hit me with a subscribe I appreciate all the uh, help and input and uh, definitely comments uh, look forward to anybody else's thoughts because yeah like I say I'm just a private pilot just doing my best to try to stay current just trying to keep my flight chops sharp alright take it easy